Hi there, uh, this is Adam Dewhurst, and thank you for downloading and watching my uh, accompanying video to the turning your three-dimensional sculpts into fully realized creature concepts. Uh, in this video we're going to look at the um, main sculpt, uh, which is uh, about an hour 15 in total. Um, we're going to watch the video, I've sped it up to about four times speed, and I'll walk you through uh, the different tools and processes I use to create that character. So. Um, the first thing I'm going to do here is uh, load in the image plane which we created uh, in uh, our paint over, so that's step three. Um, and as you can see, when you load it in, you get this little controller cursor and you can position your image plane wherever you want, really. In this case, I've, I've slapped it in the middle of my palette. Um, and I'm using Z-Spheres again. Z-Spheres are an uh, optional tool you can select. And very easy, you simply just uh, use your draw button. I'm highlighting uh, the uh, the draw button right now um, to draw out your spheres and then uh, again in the top left there are icons for move, scale and rotate and every time you draw a sphere you can move it, scale it, position it so in a way it becomes like a, a very controllable rig um, that you can adapt to create your character. Now um, you'll see there that my character quickly popped into a mesh mode. Well, the great thing about Z-Spheres is that as you work it, if you click the A button, uh, which is a shortcut for adaptive mesh, it'll quickly give you a preview of how your model is going to look once it's converted to polygons. So you can see if you're getting you know, the right rough form and enough resolution in certain areas. Um, okay, so I've simply redrawn my character here, bringing the reference back in and uh, I'm just roughing out the legs. So um, what's useful is you can see you can draw, you don't have to go to the end point of any shape to add a Z-sphere. You can insert that Z-sphere into the middle of your mesh and uh, scale it up, scale it down, rotate it, move it around. There's a, there's a slight fall off uh, from the controls, so when you do move one, if, uh, if it's very near another Z-sphere, you'll tend to have a little bit of a control over that too. Um, but I'm just trying to block the shape in here and create a rough sort of rabbit hair-like shape without making it look, you know, too too cartoony or too humanized. And I can always bring it back and rotate it and try and line it up with my reference image to make sure I am still getting that concept right. Um, so I'm just going to block the head in here, put a rough neck in. It's a little small right now, and uh, just scaling that up so we can get enough. Uh, enough of the shape right around where the head is. And you can see here, it looks like there's little joints in the head, and that's literally the way that each Z-sphere is connected to the next one. It is literally like a, if those of you are familiar with 3D modeling, it's like a skeletal joint um, to position and rig your model. So uh, in the first um, concept sculpt, the ears, the four ear idea was a, a later addition. Uh, now I know that we're going to push that idea, so I'm putting that straight into the um, Z-spheres at, at the base level so that I have enough resolution to um, to start with. Um, at this point it looks like I've got most of most of the form in there, so I'm really just altering position, scale, um, trying to make sure that it doesn't look I don't know, too cartoony. Uh, we want it to sit in a real world. It, at this point, you know, it does have the air of a sort of cartoon silhouette and admittedly a lot of that realism will come when we add the detail but uh, uh, I'm, I'm looking to get proportions right so again here just comparing it to the paint over and I think at this point it's looking pretty good loading that in and again you can see the controller there for my image plane I can move it over to the left so this way I can put the two of them next to it, hit A see my mesh and what it looks like and um, decide right that looks about right to me. So at this point I've turned um, adaptive mesh on and we've converted this to a sculptable shape so now we're out of Z-Sphere mode, we are onto our base mesh and you can see already that I've got a lot more form than I did on the original concept because we know where we're going and that's the benefit of having the um, that is the benefit of doing the concept sculpt first and that you you know you get out all your bad ideas and you uh, you can start off this main sculpt at a much cleaner point. So um, this is one of the primary brushes I like to use, Clay Buildup. It's quite um, popular in 3D sculpting circles in that it's um, you know it's a little dirtier in a way than the standard um, the standard brush. So the standard brush is is like painting with toothpaste. It, it's it's basically a, a tubular 
uh, soft fall off. Um, the nice thing about the clay build-up brush is that it has a square alpha, so when you when you lay it down, it, it gives a very rough surface, and in a way that's quite nice because it starts giving you just a little surface texture, which you know may give you ideas and forms later. But it builds up the surface really quickly, which is great. The other brush I'm using a lot here is Snake Hook and Move. So you can see I've got Snake Hook selected right now. Well, Snake Hook essentially is like a more powerful version of the of the move brush it just drags out the surface um, move is is a sort of wider more generalized moving of the surface and snake hook is as if you were sort of yanking and pulling something along they're both doing the same function but each has a sort of a different strength in a way um, so I've masked out the edges of the ears and I pulled that surface down and what I've just done is dynamesh it and the dynamesh function in ZBrush basically just it, it remeshes, it triangulates your mesh, so if you've added any surface, in this case the, the bulk of the ears, it simply uh, uh, re, you know, recreates it as a triangulated uh, uh, surface, so it's a, it's a decimated mesh. Um, and it just gives us more surface to play with. Uh, so now back to the clay build-up, I'm trying to build up some rough form, some, some musculature in there. Um, sculpting out the armpits, just bringing the arms in a little bit. Okay, so what I'm doing here is using masks uh, to mask out areas that, so that I can move uh, the fingers around without affecting the rest of the model. And very easy to mask. Um, what I normally do is, is mask a select area and then hit invert. It's a lot easier than selecting the rest of the mesh. Um, so uh, I'm going to move back to the clay buildup. As I said before, the primary brushes I'm using at this stage are pretty much uh, move or snake hook, uh, clay buildup, and dam standard, which I'll use more as we get further along. Um, so again, trying to shape it a little here, give it some slightly more rabbit-like features. Uh, still working to my concept, uh, which we have in the background. And um, what we'll do as we'll go along is I'll try and build it, bringing uh, some more uh, ref to work on. Uh, I don't have ref to one side, uh, I'm working on one monitor. Um, so I, I have a bunch of reference of uh, uh, rabbits, hairs, creatures, some Bobby Chu illustrations um, put to one side that uh, you'll see I'll bring in as we go along. Um, so there we go, I've just masked out the ear area and now I'm using the transpose tool to basically re-angle those um, to a position where the issue I had with when I blocked these in is that I felt that the, the, the two outer areas were hiding the two behind, so now I'm going to just try and position these so that you can see both sets and make the, the set underneath it may be just a little bit uh, bigger so you can you can see them poke out in short <coughs> so I, I kind of want the, the outer set to, to poke outwards to the side and I want the inner set to be essentially going going back up and back so again back to down, uh, back to uh, clay build up sorry and still trying to just I don't want any square edges I want the I want it to be round organic feeling so again just trying to block in some some rough musculature um, some more organic forms I'm looking to have those front finger those two front paws basically um, quite large and the thumb a little bit smaller uh, the main one of the main things about the concept was that I couldn't stand the the five the human five little dumpy fingers so I'm really trying to get something a little more um, well, a little less human. Uh, so we're looking at uh, three digits on the hand and two two on the feet. Um, so again, just working back and forth um, with the clay build-up brush, I'm trying to uh, again insinuate that there's some some muscle there. And the material here, this red wax, uh, is the standard that comes in that brush. It's not a particularly pleasant-looking material, but again, the point of this tutorial is to show you guys that with very basic ZBrush understanding, you can block this in. So I'm not changing any of the default settings. I've not got a particular custom interface. Uh, I'm just uh, using the basics. So I've used the insert sphere um, uh, option here to put a sphere in the eye. And as you do it, it masks out that object. And then I've inverted my mask here. And um, what I've done is uh, gone down to in the subtool palette and gone to split uh, mesh by uh, masked and it's taken those two spheres I inserted and made them into a separate polygroup. So now I can 
uh, use them as a reference and sculpt the uh, eyelid shape around the eyeball. It's a really useful tip uh, instead of trying to sculpt in spheres that are part of your mesh to actually separate it and work around it. If you do need it to be one mesh, you can always recombine those later. So it's just a very helpful way to try and make eyelids. So now I'm onto Dam Standard, and what Dam Standard does is like a nicer version of a knife or a cut tool. It's got a nicer fall off, um, and you can use it if you use it in its normal setting. It cuts into the surface. If you use it in its negative, it'll give you a nice sort of ridged surface. So. Uh, so I'm using it here to just refine the edges of the fingers. I've used it to pull out the nose, and so now it's a it's a great way to mark into your surface. So I'm using it to pull out some shoulders, just marking some recesses into the model. Um, and again, still trying to focus on getting some form into this. It's already, I think, in a better state than the original concept, which is great. Um, but there, there's a, there's a slight weight issue I feel like the the angle of the chest at the moment is a little straight, so hopefully we'll add some some weight. Now I'm just going to re-angle the, the ankle, the back of the feet, give that some bone and some musculature. Super basic, super quick, and as you see, I'm mostly using that clay build up and move. So just saving the project, remember to save uh, as you go, uh, and we're going to keep refining this as we go along. So this is a uh, four times speed. Uh, as I said, it was a uh, I think an hour fifteen in total to do this. I didn't want to spend too long because I know that I'm going to be spending time posing and lighting, and then and then uh, the the bulk of the time in Photoshop. Actually, it's really just to get a form down, so I don't need to try and paint that in in Photoshop. So again, just trying to round off the hands and running a smooth on everything, getting rid of some of that noise and masking out the ears so I can work on those separately, give them a little bit of a bend, a little bit of shape again I don't, it's the, they wouldn't be straight in nature um, that is, would look very weird so we're going to give the, the back ones a little bit of a just a little bit of shape, a little bit of a bend as well and I'm trying to insinuate that there's some muscle under the uh, the joint of the ears, at the top of the skull some bone in there so we're giving that a little bit of a, a recess and a little bit of a bulge. So at this point we have um, we're dropping the concept because I feel like we've got to the same point that concept was at. And I'm now going to start looking at real world ref. This is a jackrabbit, a close up of a jackrabbit, um, which for me was sort of halfway between a hare and a rabbit, and is really great reference because they've they've got these huge ears, they've got these very long limbs, and it was sort of the closest this guy, but our guy's a little more cartoony in a way, he, I did say initially I wanted to steer away from that, but he is, he's a character and he's, the idea is that he's a vaguely sentient character, so um, I am giving him a bigger eyeball, uh, I want to make the eye quite a large feature later on, and so he's, he's got some human characteristics about him, but it's great to look at the real world ref, because obviously I want to sit this in a real world. So uh, I'm now using that reference to try and get some of that bulge around the eye. Hopefully it'll get some of that recess underneath there. You know, sh shape out the, the snout and the muzzle. And just make it a, a, just a little bit more believable. I, there is nothing so good as looking at real world reference. If you're making it up from your head, it might be a great source of inspiration, but it's, uh, sometimes it's hard to sell that as a concept, so uh, always look at real world ref, um, you're only going to benefit from it. Uh, as I say, I have a whole folder full of reference of rabbits for this particular job. Um, and not just rabbits as well, other the creatures. Um, something else was in there, there were some uh, some gophers and some uh, shrews and some uh, lots of rodents, uh, and also weirdly some frogs because I was looking at the skin pattern, so y you really never know what you're going to you know, be putting into this. So I've now switched the material over to a um, basically just a sort of a light, uh, like a thong. It's, it's a light, glossy material, and the idea is to give it some reflection so that I can see where the highlights are going to be on my object. So I wouldn't do this straight away because you're still refining the form. But now I want to start picking out actual muscles. I want to start, you know, carving in some some shapes into this. So there you, go, you saw my reference folder there. Now I'm looking at a. Uh, the jackrabbit standing up because I want to see how that cheek area works so I'm just refining the jaw to kind of 
sit in line with, with that as an idea, bending those ears a little bit more, and trying to add some interesting... You can see that large like fold going into the ear on the reference, so I'm trying to add something vaguely similar to this. And I'm puffing out the chest again. Although that jackrabbit has fur, it, and ultimately I don't intend mine to have fur, um, I'm still going to try and sort of assimilate that, that look where he's somewhat standing proud with that chest puffed out, although mine's going to have a leaf uh, motif on it. Um, okay, so we're we're getting close to where you know this basic shape is going to be done, um, and trying to you know f make these more recognisable as as digits. So I'm going to pull out the feet, pull out the hands, start using that damn standard brush to carve in, or almost as reference where I want the folds on the on the fingers and feet to be. Um, so just continually working this back and forth. I actually find it quite therapeutic um, to do. So I'll often do this in downtime, and at the beginning of the day, just as like a little warm-up exercise, just start making something off the top of my head. I'm trying to give this guy, oh there you go, some little little work on his biceps. I'm trying to find a little elbow. So this is a slightly more humanoid characteristic. And what I was thinking here was that he would ultimately be some kind of sort of magical, I don't know, fairy rabbit. If anyone's ever seen the film um, Maleficent, it has some really fantastic creature designs that are all themed on nature. There's a like a mushroom troll and a, um, there's, there is a leaf fairy, there's a water fairy, there's just some beautiful designs where they really meld that whole idea of nature and uh, creature together. Um, in fact, most of the concept art is available online so I thoroughly encourage everyone to go have a look at Maleficent creature concept art. You'll find some fantastic designs of exactly the sort of thing we're trying to do here. But um, yeah, beginning to like this guy a little bit more. He's sort of got a little bit of a mouse-like vibe, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm, I'm quite liking that. I'm trying to puff his chest out a little bit more. I think the main areas that need work here now are that basically the feet and, and the hands. The head and the chest have come along uh, quite nicely. But that's always an easier area to work, because you sort of recognize more of your character in, in, those, in those sections. So... What I'm going to do now is just mask out those hands so I can focus on the areas they were obscuring, mainly the, the top of the feet. So I can shape those a little bit more now, pull areas out, smooth them back down, and just generally refine that. I'm trying to pull those toes together so it's a little bit more of a cohesive uh, single foot shape and not just something with two little blobby little digits pulled out. So again, just trying to refine that down a little bit, shape those out and bulge them up a little bit so it looks like they are you know actual uh, extruding digits and not and not just sort of blobby forms that sit on the end I'm trying to get some creases in there refine the muscles a little bit I would say that if there was a weakest area to this in retrospect looking back it's it's definitely the legs I was less fussed about the legs going in because I knew that a lot of my pose would hide them so that I didn't focus hugely on there but it's this is the benefit of using the Z-Sphere, because you can block out the entire figure, and then um, you, you know, you're, you're forced with the reality of having to complete a full figure. And you'll see an awful lot of busts online, particularly with Z-Brush artists. Um, and that's, um, that's great. It's a great way to concept someone, but there's a big difference between conceiving a head and shoulders and conceiving a full figure. So uh, I'm just going to get some, some folds in here, some creases over the hands, basically the same treatment I've just given the feet. I'm just going to come in and try and actually make those digits feel a part of the the rest of it. So add some fat, add some folds. It's um it's getting pretty close. So I'm gonna take this um in this video I'm gonna take this basically almost the entire way. The last stage I'll do before I finish is get some alphas and use them like stamps on the surface so that I can get some bumping and some sort of leathery patterning. But I think we're we're actually pretty close to having this roughed in. I mean, you could take this and paint right on top of this. Goodness knows there's enough um, texture patterning you can do using uh, overlay layers in Photoshop. But, um, yeah, that's that's pretty good. I think that's, that's about where we left it. Um, and at this point, I'd save that, as I say, like an hour, 15 or so. And then work on top of that with... Uh, with lots of alphas and shape it and add detail and then we're ready to take that into um, texture painting. 
So yeah, this is the beginning of that stage, just adding a few more creases. But uh, happy with that. So there we go. Uh, that is how we went about making, that's uh, how I went about making the uh, the main sculpt for our uh, concept. Thanks a lot, guys. Hi guys, and welcome to another accompanying part to my series on turning your uh, ZBrush sculpts into full creature concepts. So, I'm going to walk you guys through a little bit of the poly paint tools in ZBrush. Um, so, uh, this is where we finished up with the sculpt after we add use the alphas to create a little bit of surface detail. Um, and what I'm going to do first is just apply some materials to the th basically the three different objects I've got here. I've got the eyes, I've got the nails, and I've got the main body. So the eyes, I am giving um, the toy plastic shader just so it's very shiny. The um, uh, body, I'm going to give uh, a skin surface 4. And these all come as default. And the nails, I think I may have given them skin surface 4 as well, just like a darker shade. And the first thing I do is I take the uh, skin, I'm going to, the nails and the eyes, I'm going to largely um, ignore those, um, but the skin, um, I'm gonna, I flood that by going to the color menu at the top, um, the, the drop down menu, it's the third one along color, and I flood the object with, in this case, a bright orange. The idea being that I'm going to try and make this an autumn like leaf look to um, our rabbit. Um, so, first thing I've done here is I've masked the whole object. Um, I've gone to the masking window, I've masked by cavity. It sort of does, what it does is it, it takes all your indents from the sculpt and it masks them. I've then hit the blur button from the masking menu and I've inverted that. So, what it'll allow me to do now is I make a slightly darker shade than my base color here and I just start basically um, roughly putting that down over the surface. So, it gives me um, just uh, it brings out the, the shapes a little bit, um, but it, it basically just sort of highlights where the darker crevices are on the model. And it's the first thing I'll do on any um, poly painting before I start coming in with different tones. So now I've switched up to one of those two alphas that I talk about um, in the uh, tutorial, uh, basically alpha 22 and alpha 7. Again, they both come as standard. Uh, one is a sort of spotty uh, alpha, and the other one is um, veiny. And all I do is set them to the spray um, uh, option in how you apply it. So it's not a brush stroke, it's a spray. Same sort of effect you might get by using uh, spreading out your alpha in Photoshop. And I turn the opacity down, and I just start using that to uh, highlight some areas. So you can see I've highlighted the muzzle here. And I've gone in and also just darkened around the eyes and around the ears and uh, the nose and the lips. And and this particular one, this Alpha 7 that's, that's spotty, using that's great because it gives it a kind of, um, gives the, the skin a kind of mottly look. So I'm just picking some areas to darken um, you know, between the fingers, the bottom of the feet. Um, and just just give it a little bit of variant. We're not going f uh, variegation. We're not going for a photo real look here. I'm just trying to give it a base texture. That means that when we come to using Photoshop, we've got some different tones in it, and it, we can highlight that when we start playing with levels and start using overlay layers. Um, and it just gives it a little. It's just a little nicer than working straight from like a flat orange color. So now I'm taking another tone of green. I'm trying to give a little bit more of that leaf vibe uh, into the ears. So again, still working with that veiny and spotty um, alpha type. And what I'm doing now is I've switched up my uh, main brush from a spray to a drag. So I'm using that veiny texture. And this is a, a button that allows you, this is a brush type that allows you to drag out that alpha onto the surface. So all I'm trying to do is just drag in some subtle, subtle vein-like um, uh, forms onto the ears. Um, and again, straight back to Alpha 22 and, and Alpha 7. So more blocking in for the body. I'm trying to highlight the stems of the leaf motif that's on his um, on his chest. This is 
this is not with the spray, this is just with dots or um, it's, it's just similar to a normal brush stroke. So I'm just trying to very roughly highlight those areas that I sculpted in. Again, just to give it something that pulls it out, a different, different surface. And uh, it just makes it easier to use. And the poly painting is, um, I think a lot of people think that ZBrush can't do texture painting work, but it's it's super simple. You're using exactly the same brushes you do when you're sculpting. In this case, I've got the standard brush. And at the top of the uh, menu, I'm going to highlight this now. Uh, you'll see there's an RGB button. And so I've got that on, I've turned Z add and Z sub off. So it's not going to actually add to the sculpt form, but it is going to add our RGB tones. So it, you, I'm just using the normal sculpt brushes and instead of sculpting form I'm sculpting uh, patterns. And it's the same set of alphas as well. So now I'm just going to work on the nails a little bit and really again I'm just adding some noise here using the spotty alpha just to give, make those nails maybe a little bit darker at the base. In actual fact we never went back to really work on the nails uh, in the Photoshop um, exercise. So um, this in fact um, proved to be enough just to get it you know as a recognizably as a as a nail uh, shape um, so I'm just putting this into a position and playing a little bit with the lighting here I'm hitting the BPR render button just to see how the shadows might look um, and again uh, the lighting options are uh, a drop down menu at the top and all you get presented with is a sphere and you can move the light source around and see what sort of look you might want to achieve. So it's really simple to, you know, just guessing how this might look at a render. Um, now I'm going to try and bring some purple into that, uh, some purple veins into those leaves, just something to make it, you know, ping a little bit. Um, I think I've got enough orange and yellow in here, so trying some purples, trying some yellows in there. And at this point, I'm trying to see if I want to trying to get some more mottling over the shoulder so I've taken to a darker brown and uh, I'm putting that on the brow actually I feel like I could have gone darker there, it would have been nice to bring that up a little bit more because I think that was quite effective but it's just sort of some patterning and uh, some of the reference I looked at for this was um, toads and frogs because I knew this guy wasn't going to have fur so I wanted to give him a kind of natural a natural skin tone and I was looking at something a little bit with a little bit more of a translucent skin bear in mind that the leaf um, the leaf is are essentially going to be slightly translucent so I felt like maybe if the skin had a similar vibe so again I was referring to um, I was referring back to real world reference uh, the whole time that's always a key part of any design is looking at what uh, exists in the real world and maybe trying to imitate that so this sits comfortably in people's minds when they look at it. It's not something that seems immediately very alien. It's something that might have elements that you can relate to. Um, so again, just trying to add some shadowy areas here from the back. We didn't, I didn't work on the back a lot because I had no intention to show it. If this had been a fully realized 3D sculpt for a full production, maybe a film or a commercial or a TV show, obviously it's an area that we would have had to build, but in this case there's not a lot of sculpt detail there and there's not a lot of uh, painting detail either. So again, I'm just hitting the BPR button, I'm highlighting that for you guys now, and every time I hit that button I can set up a render and see how my object is going to look with shadows. The ZBrush render tools aren't bad, they're, they're not up to the level that you might use with Arnold or Keyshot or something like that, but you can really achieve some quite good stuff um, without having to go through a full render, and that's kind of the exact point of this uh, tutorial series and that will do create these renders in ZBrush and they'll be basic and then we're going to take them into Photoshop layer them up and uh, sort of fake that compositing and um, create hopefully a nice concept at the end of it so um, color wise this is um, it's getting there I'm going back to laying in some more veins on the ears trying to add um, some darkness where the stem of that leaf pattern is uh, so again I'm switching up this time to the dots again like a freehand brush as I mentioned before. It's a little strong um, the brush stroke in places uh, but that's okay because a lot of this will get drawn over um, and we can we can completely eliminate this if we want to as well. In fact largely some of this patterning does get eliminated uh, in the next stage so it's really just to give this some tone and some values um, to play with it. I actually could have been quite a lot bolder with this. This is generally all 
some in a, in a very similar ballpark. I probably could have added more greens, um, some like richer reds as well um, to the veiny areas. I'm just going to try and darken that eye a little bit. And again, although this is largely just sort of soft brush marks, having that alpha with the veins just breaks it up a little bit. It just uh, I hate using just a standard um, you know sphere with a fall off um, or circle with a fall off as a brush. It's just not very interesting. It doesn't give it uh, any sort of surface detail at all. So try a render again. Um, again, I think that's that's looking pretty good. So this this is pretty much where we got to on the poly paint. Um, just happy with that. And at this point, it's ready to pose or light and bring it into. Uh, uh, Photoshop for the next stage. Thanks a lot. Hi guys, so we're going to go straight into our uh, lighting and posing uh, video. Um, so what I've got here is a, is a again a four times uh, speed up of about an hour, an hour ten's work, maybe just trying to conceive how um, we're going to light this image. The first thing I do is bring in a bunch of different environments as image planes and I just move my character around, take a quick screen grab and um, try lots of different things so I can review them all later. So I've got a bunch of woodland scenes. I've tried to get them all from essentially like a worm's eye view but there's some different stuff in here. Like this was the idea of a small rabbit and then a giant sized forest rabbit. So I'm still experimenting with the concept a little bit. Um, but trying to see, you know, different different environments, different scenarios, and just uh, have a gauge for what's going to work because I can't really start lighting this um, in ZBrush until I know the light source of the main environment. So this also will really help me um, guide um, the concept as we move along. So I felt um, this image was actually early on was quite successful, and I almost went with this one, um, but. Um, what I'm doing is just moving it around, even on the same background, trying a couple of different positions to see what works. Uh, again, this one, the tones just worked beautifully with what we'd already um, conceived. So again, trying a different scale, take a quick screen grab of that. And I have my um, screen grab uh, button uh, macro, well, not quite a macro, but I have it set up on my Windows box that every time I hit print screen, it um, puts that screen grab into my OneDrive folder. I think that's a, it's actually a pretty th easy thing to set up. Um, I'm on Windows 10 and uh, it's, pr it's somewhere in your s Windows settings. Very easy to set up. Wasn't anything particularly complex or advanced. It just means that all my screen grabs um, quickly go off to my OneDrive. So here, here they are, in fact. Um, so I'm going to bring some of them out now and just like bring them all up on my monitor, have a little look, flick through them, see what's working, what isn't working. And I think uh, these two images or these two environments were the two that I felt were the strongest. And th the main goal of this exercise was really to um, show off the character design. So there were a couple of other environments. There's one where he's quite small that was actually pretty successful. And while that would have been nice as maybe um, a full-blown 3D render, it um, didn't showcase the character, the, the, the design enough. So I felt like this particular background here was the strongest option for that because it really melded well with the autumn feeling of the leaves we're going for. So now that I've chosen this one, I'm going to try and um, figure out the lighting information. So again. It's not a full-blown render and I'm going to cheat an awful lot of the lighting in Photoshop so all I'm really looking to do is just set up something as a basic guide. So I've put in my lights uh, at the top, I've increased them so it's brighter and the other light I'm experimenting with, you can put in, I think it comes with uh, by default with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, there's 8 pre-made light settings in ZBrush so I'm actually using the first and the last one and the last one is a rim light that's behind your objects and the first one is your main light source so all I've done is simply move that off uh, the main light off to the upper uh, it's the upper right hand side uh, emphasis on upper so above him um, because this is really a sort of middle of the day kind of lighting all that lights coming from the, the brightness above the trees and I, I felt like a little um, to the right as well and then I'm just giving him a little bit of a rim light behind him because I kind of wanted the sense that the, the, the I want to try to illuminate those those leaves. So I'm going to try and cheat that a little bit. So there's a lot of moving the lights around, playing with the intensity, and then hitting that BPR button that we used a little bit 
in the last um, tutorial. And I, as I say, saving the project as we go. Um, once I get this to a, a satisfactory point, um, we'll start looking at trying to pose him. And again, keeping this reference image in the background because although it's, we're not going to render that image, uh, it's going to uh, inform the overall concept. So um, the idea that I'm going to go with here is I've, I've actually hit the um, transpose button. So there's a transpose master tool under the Z plugin, which comes again, it comes as standard. And all it really does is combine your subtools. So my subtools here are the, uh, the eyeball, the nails, and the body. Now if I had a character with belts, and buckles, and cloth, and trousers, and all kinds of bits, the benefit here is that it combines everything. It lets you uh, mask the whole, the whole, all the different objects, the whole thing, and pose it. And then when you unselect that transpose master, um, what it does is it uh, separates everything back out, puts it all back where it was in separate, as uh, separate objects, and it takes it all to a um, higher subdivision level. So um, all I'm really doing here is masking out areas using the mask lasso. Um, option, masking out the leg, and then I'm going to use the transpose tool to either rotate, ideally just to rotate, but also in at times uh, move, to give this guy some kind of character. I don't want him in what we call a T-pose position, where he's just standing there, arms out, all straight, because it's kind of boring. Um, I want to give him some kind of personality. So the, the pose I'm looking to achieve here is as if he's been emerging from screen left, uh, so I'm trying to extend out this back leg, and, and honestly, this is quite tricky with a rabbit in this pose, because how I've sculpted it, there's no geo underneath the folds of the leg. So um, it's not <laughs> behaving very well. You can see how I'm having to um, move that geometry around a little bit. So essentially, I'm kind of re-sculpting, um, and I'm smoothing it down because there's some errors happening to try and make it just look a little better, because with that knee pointing up there, you can see that back leg looks really kind of kind of ugly. Um, the so I, I know that I do not want to have that leg as the, in any way in focus um, when I get to my final pose because at this point I'd have to come back and resculpt it and that's that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean it's certainly a, a valid option at this point, but we're trying to emphasise quick concept sculpts and quick paint overs. And since we're talking in like an hour for the original sculpt maybe half an hour poly painting at uh, this particular stage was around an hour you know you're already hitting up the three hour mark so I don't want to push this uh, have to go back to a sculpting stage I just want to get this kind of blocked in and then we'll we'll focus on um, all the texture detail so I, with a bit of the move brush a bit of smoothing I've managed to soften that back leg a bit and now I'm trying to rotate the head round so we can position him and I'm trying to give him a sort of curious look as if he's emerging out that front hand is a little high at this point, um, so we're going to want to sort of mask that and move it down. But yeah, working on the arms, uh, and you can uh, there's, there's a lots of options in your masking sub palette. You can blur it, you can invert it, you can expand the mask, shrink the mask. So it's quite versatile in that sense, um, and it's a very quick way to post stuff. And more often than not, when you're conceiving characters and pitching. Uh, on jobs, three-dimensional, uh, 3D commercials or uh, film work, you know, you get to a very early stage where directors and um, film producers want to see concepts of characters, and uh, they don't, they don't get a T pose. They don't understand seeing it in a in a neutral pose. They want to see, they want to see it in some kind of action pose. Um, so uh, this is quite common. You don't have time to do a full 3D rig. You just want to pose the sculptures. It's a really powerful part of ZBrush, which allows you to not only sculpt something, but once you're finished sculpting it, to put it into some kind of interesting position to sell the character, essentially. So a slight um, accident of all this moving parts is that somehow, at some point, I accidentally did not mask out the thumb, and it got warped. So now at this point, I'm just trying to fix that front thumb because it's really been kind of skewed. So all I've done is gone back here. I've used the inflate brush to give it its volume back. And now I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of trying to hide it, to be honest, um, uh, because it's it's one of the uh, the weaker parts. And again, I don't want to spend a lot of time uh, re-sculpting it. So we're kind of we're kind of getting there. It's sort of giving it that feel. And this particular position you're seeing here is the my original concept for um, 
the actual angle. So um, we'll go back to that in a minute. I think it's um, it's basically, as I say, coming in from screen left. Again, trying to fix that rear leg here. So that angle there is what I originally uh, conceived as the main pose. But actually, once I'd finished posing it, I realized it wasn't the strongest position. So um, again, the ears are symmetrical. I don't want this model to be symmetrical anyway. So I'm going to try and just pose those out separately. So I'll use the mask lasso tool to mask each one, maybe blur it a bit, maybe add a little bit, subtract a little bit, and then I can use the transpose tool to position my pivot in the middle of that object and then move it to a different angle. And I'll do that on, on pretty much uh, all, all four is. Um, otherwise it's going to look kind of uh, kind of symmetrical. So um, I mean you could just use the move tool as well but it's going to be a little harder to control. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's getting there bit by bit. Uh, still working on those legs. Trying to move them, trying to shove that front leg further forward. So it looks like he's putting a little bit more weight on it, rotate it around a little bit. And I think it's just that, it, that poses the whole time. It's just, it's just still not quite working. It's got a lot of odd, um, it's creating quite an odd silhouette as well. Um, so when I got to a point where I felt like he was uh, in, the, in a unique position, like I've applied. I've applied all my my posing changes. It's got to split it back out to different sub tools. Reapplied our poly paint, and now I can rotate it and see if maybe there's another angle that'll work a little better. I can still use the move tool and trying some renders here to look at the shadows. Of course, when you render, you lose that background image, um, so it's it's only helping me sort of envision the shadow. So for conceiving the concepts, I can't really hit the render button. I just need to rotate around and just see what position is going to work best. Uh, so again, this isn't quite cutting the mustard. I'm trying it a little further back, a little smaller, moving it around. I got to this position and felt actually, in a way, that looked a little more curious, even though I intended him to come in from screen left. And that was a little nicer. I'm still bothered by that back leg, so still trying to work that in a little bit. And again, you can see another accident there where the rear nails have been kind of squashed. So again, I'm inflating that, moving it back out, just trying to clean it up a little bit. So this is, as I say, it isn't a fully rigged tool. You really are just squashing the forms, moving them around. Um, it's not ideal. But if I had made this with a lot of subdivision levels, um, it would mean I could go down to the lowest level and the warping of all that fine sculpt detail would be less prominent, if that makes sense. So... I think I got it to somewhere around here and felt like that was a more successful pose. And at that point, the big omission was the fact that my ears on my left hand side, screen left of my character, were felt a little squashed. So I'm just going to mask out the rest of him and rotate those out so they were a little more prominent. As I said when we redesigned this, this the ears really became the main focus of this character. So uh, I'm just going to essentially rotate them, bring them around to the foreground, so we can really um, we can see them. And if, if you bring up your timeline in the ZBrush um, movie drop-down menu, you, if you click on the timeline at any point, it'll basically key that particular rotation of your model. So I have keyed this position. Um, and it means I can keep referring back to this particular pose, which means that I can rotate around and work on the model, but then I can come back to this point at any time. So now I'm happy with the position. I'm going to play with the lighting a little bit. I've overblown the top lighting a, a little bit for this. And um, I'm just going to see uh, if I can make a nice shaded render of this guy, see how that looks. So uh, I'm actually... <laughs> I'm redrawing the. Uh, I'm gonna before I do my renders. Um, if I did them right now, uh, they're not screen grabs. They'll be rendering to my ZBrush document size. So uh, I'm just checking how big I want to make it, and I'm gonna resize my document. ZBrush is essentially, in fact, a 2D package. It was originally. So I've resized my document, and then I'm gonna reinsert my mesh. You can see here. I have to clean, clear that palette, redraw it. 
Um, I've still got my keyed position, so I can still refer back to that. It's a little off-center now, so I can bring it back down. Um, and now when I render, it'll be at that new scale that I recreated the document at. Um, so that's an important thing to remember. If you go and buy ZBrush, uh, ZBrush uh, the default settings, it's actually got quite a small palette size. And if you're exporting out these renders, you're going to document and export, and it'll export out whatever you've set. So it's important to remember if you're looking for something 2K, 4K, you need to make sure you set your document at that size. So, um, and again, I'm just trying to reposition this before I set up my renders. And the renders I'm going to look to do are a completely shaded um, render. That'll be my main render. I'm going to look to do um, a shadow pass. Uh, I'm going to look to do a um, ambient occlusion pass, a depth pass, uh, possibly subsurface. Um, and I'm then going to look to do four different lighting renders from left, right, top, and bottom, which I'm going to use to stack in Photoshop, and I'm going to use it to fake a um, ambient occlusion, um, not ambient occlusion, sorry, global illumination style look, like a full-on 3D render. So uh, that's where I'm aiming to be, still trying to get this set up. And then we'll basically hit render and see um, see what we create. And again, if you go through the tutorial, you'll see we, I think we produce uh, 11 renders in total. And it really, at this stage, the more renders you want to, you can knock on different material types and try and use them as opacity layers uh, in Photoshop. I would encourage you to just go wild. Um, so if there's different materials you want to try, you could try the clay material. I've, this is still skin shade. Um, you could try lots of different things. So um, at this point, the more renders you make of this, the more it's going to help your paint over. So we only, we actually only really did lit and shadowed uh, renders. So there we go. There's my left lighting, hitting the render button, export it, and I've got a PSD folder that I'm putting all my renders in. There's my right lighting. All I'm doing is turning all the lighting in, lights off except for the one main light. And I'm going to do uh, top and bottom, so there's the bottom lighting. And I'm going to do top as well. And then I mentioned before, um, we uh, talked, I, as I said, uh, different material types. Well, I always apply the whole thing with a reflective material, and we'll use this to fake uh, highlights, essentially like a shininess or a wetness. So we'll export that out on its own as well. Um, but that was the only real different material we tried. You could definitely try a bunch of different ones. So that's that's the full posing, lighting, and render setup. It's only about an hour. It's super simple. Um, we didn't do anything too advanced. Again, no particular plugins or extra tools. It's really just um, the basic ZBrush uh, setup. ZBrush or ZBrush, depending on... I don't know. It should be ZBrush, really. Yeah, I guess I'm just uh, using the wrong name. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, all the basic uh, default settings uh, to produce some nice, uh, some nice renders that we can utilize in Photoshop. So there you go. Uh, join me for the next part where um, we'll have a time lapse of uh, the full uh, layer stacking in Photoshop. Thanks a lot. Hi guys, and thank you for um, downloading my uh, the last parts um, for my videos that accompany my tutorial series on how to turn your concept sculpts. Um, into a fully realized uh, Photoshop concept. Um, so I'm going to provide this for you guys. It's at four times speed again. It's about two hours, so it's sped up to about half an hour. Um, I'm giving you this this one without commentary because it's mostly um, applying a lot of reference images of uh, woodlands, um, the foreground, the background, mixing that up, applying them with layer masks, um, blending them using uh, some opacity, um, different uh, layer types, and then also applying uh, some texture to the creature, um, like some elephant skin, some actual leaf uh, surfaces, uh, and then compositing in, blending in some things like eyeballs and uh, other little nice texture bits. So um, hopefully the video should give you uh, some more information in the written tutorial. Um, and as I say, it's about half an hour long, so enjoy. Thanks a lot.